we are on time, so I will start here. Um, I am so excited to be here. This is my first config management camp. I was at FOSDAM uh, this weekend, also my first FOSDAM. Um, first time in Belgium, actually. So um, I'm really excited to be here, and I'm happy to see uh, some very nice humans. Um, my session is called Recording Ansible, Building Ansible with Ansible, and Testing with Ansible. Um, dog, I heard you like Ansible, so you know. Built your Ansible with Ansible. Um, so, who am I? Um, I'm David Morrisamard. Um, you can reach me on, on Matrix or Fossadon. Um, I, I fly from Montreal in Canada. Um, and I have a background that is um, fairly wide in system administration, CI, CD, SRE, um, and you know, various things uh, about servers and infrastructure and application deployment and all of that. Um, I've been using Ansible for a pretty long time. Um, last I recall was at least in 2014, back in 1.8. I remember the transition to 2.0, that was fun. Um, I was previously in the Ansible community team, not anymore, but you know, I'm here and <laughs> I still chat with them, so it's cool. Um, nowadays, I'm a part-time open source contributor, uh, independent, um, and between DevOps and uh, DatOps uh, duty, um, you know, um, as a hobby, if you will. Um, so, about this presentation. Uh, everything you will see here, uh, you can try at home, you can try right here in this session. Um, it's available, it's open source, you can help improve it too. Um, it's not exhaustive, so it, it, I don't go very uh, in depth. Uh, I try to leave breadcrumbs a little bit everywhere. There's a lot of links throughout the presentation, so this will allow you to um, go and dig for more information if you're interested um, in looking at them. I am uh, happy to chat about anything that's in there. Um, it is part of, the, part of the work that I've done when I was in the Ansible community. So feel free to reach out, either on Matrix, uh, Fossilon, or, you know, right here. Um, I won't bore you with what is Ansible, because if you've been here all day, you probably know what it is. Um, so radically simple IT uh, automation system. Um, so you tend to use Ansible to do configuration management. What does this look like? Um, well, for, for in this example here, um, it's a simple playbook, it installs Nginx, um, it sets up uh, a VOS config for Nginx, and then um, it ensures that Nginx is started. Um, what's cool about this is we have a, a handler here, um, so if my VOS configuration changes, it will automatically restart. So, you know, um, typical uh, configuration management with Ansible, you've probably done something like this. Um, that doesn't mean that it's the only thing that Ansible can do. Um, you probably heard the phrase, when you have a hammer, everything looks like an L, including his crew. Um, I have my friend here, uh, Girling Guy. He's done a great video on his different use cases of Ansible. Um, you know, there are some things that you might not want to use Ansible for, but I use it for a lot of things, and I think it's great. Um, so uh, before I begin, I want to lay some, some um, vocabulary, let's say, uh, because uh, what is Ansible is is different between uh, depending on the context that you you're talking about. So here we have the Ansible package. Uh, it's up on PyPI, um, and in various distros, Fedora, Debian, and so on. Uh, so this package uh, it includes or depends on uh, Ansible Core. So when you install it, it, it will pick up Ansible Core. Um, and what it is is it includes a bunch of Ansible collections out of the box that are created by the community um, and the Ansible Community Steering Committee. So it is the battery is included package that you know, most users are used to. And then you have Ansible Core, which is you know, the core runtime, uh, the command line interfaces, uh, and the base set of modules and things like file, copy, um, you know, template, uh, the basic modules that you might not um, that you might use all the time, regardless of you know where, whether you have collections or not. Is that Ansible, Ansible Core? Um, and then the question I have with you t for you today is: Can we build Ansible with Ansible? Show of hands. Can we do that? Yeah, no. I heard. Why not? So a good a good show of hands. Uh, about half the room. That's cool. Uh, so <laughs> what could go wrong, right? Why, why should we not do this? Um, so this is meant to be a fun, lighthearted talk. You know, we're at the end of the day here. 
So let's have some fun. So what does building a Python source distribution package look like? Um, if I do it by hand, um, you know, I need to clone a Git repo. Uh, this is um, the Ansible, Ansible Git repo. Um, I go inside the directory, and then I use uh, the Python uh, setup.py file uh, to build the source package, and then I have it here. Um, so I could install this, I could eventually upload it to PyPI, and so on. So it can be more complicated depending on the Python package. You know, some have binary dependencies and it gets you know complicated. But this is you know at a high level how it works. If I want to do this with Ansible, how what would this look like? So this is the same thing basically, but with Ansible. So I have a git task, and then I have a command um, a command task here. So these are very equivalent. Um, you know, I use uh, the home directory of the user. Uh, I clone a git repo in there, uh, and then I run the Python uh, as this uh, command. So building a Python source distribution package. Why? Why might you want to do that with Ansible? <laughs> Are you not causing yourself problems down the line? Um, this is an XKCD comic. I love XKCD. It's great. Um, so you might think that automating things will save you time down the line, and then in reality, you end up, you know, fixing your Ansible things because, you know, it got out of control. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, so, uh, one of the examples why you might want to do this with Ansible um, is the built-in modules, uh, the ones that I showed you earlier, uh, but also for built-in idempotency and things like that. So, if I run the same commands that I had earlier, it's going to fail because the git repo already exists. Of course, I could delete it first and run the command again and then... I could handle this in a bash script and then, you know, handling idempotency in bash is kind of tricky. Uh, but if I run the same playbook uh, with Ansible, nothing happens. Why? Well, if I go back uh, two slides, I told uh, this command um, task here, running this command will create this file. So if the file already exists, Ansible won't run it again. Idempotency. So we see here, you know, there's nothing that changed there. Um, so, what does the Ansible package look like? If I download the source package from PyPI um, and take a look inside, this is what we'll see. Uh, we will have the Ansible uh, included collections. Um, there's a bash script that is intended to rebuild the package, you know, for the sake of reproducibility. Um, there's a change log for, from, that is aggregated from every collection. Uh, there's some packaging files here and there, and then there's a porting guide. I'll get into that a little bit later. So uh, if I go inside the Ansible collections uh, directory, I'll see all the collections that are included in the package um, based by a namespace. So Amazon, um, you know, there's a community namespace in there. Uh, so those are all the collections that we ship in the package. There's a lot of them. There's a little bit over 100, unless mistaken. So then, if you dig a little bit deeper, uh, if you go inside a collection, this is what it looks like. I, uh, for example, I have community at general here. Uh, so you, ha you have basically um, a, a built release of the community.general collection. If you go uh, on GitHub and uh, github.com slash ansible collections slash community.general, um, this is not the content of the Git repo as is. It's an, an artifact of the ansible uh, Galaxy collection build command, unless mistaken. So we, we picked that up from Galaxy, put it in the Ansible package, and there it is. So these are all the, the modules that are shipped as part of Community General. There's a lot. I won't go <laughs> through them here. That's not the point. But we have a lot of collections with uh, each of their packages. So these are the batteries included that ship. So what do we need to do? We need to take a moment to drip. So what do we need to do if we want to build the Ansible package? First, uh, we need to find out the latest version of a list of collections. So somewhere we have a list of collections that we're interested in, and we need to find the latest version of them so that we can you know, include the latest version, not some random version, right? We need to download them from Ansible Galaxy. Uh, we need to update some build and version files. 
we want to aggregate, re aggregate release notes and porting guides um, about breaking changes. Uh, there's some, you know, um, necessary and miscellaneous uh, Python packaging files that I told you about. We need to actually build the package. Um, it would be cool to test it, to, you, so you know we don't ship a broken package, and then maybe a lot of other things there. Um, and then we need to record Ansible doing that somehow. All right, let's do it. So we want to find the versions of the included collections. There's a repository in the Ansible community name space called Ansible Build Data. So this is where we store the list of collections that are included in the package, and then um, uh, the, the version ranges that we're interested in. So uh, most, if not all, of the collections use semantic versioning. So what this means is um, for any given Ansible release, say uh, Ansible 6, Ansible 7, um, we will only accept a given range of, of uh, collection versions such that um, major breaking changes don't land within a, a stable release. So pretend today we have Ansible 7, uh, there's a collection that releases a new major version, we will leave that up to the next Ansible release, so Ansible 8, such that you know, users are generally not impacted by staying on the same you know, Ansible major release. So we have this repo here with the build file and the version ranges. Um, and then we need to clone that repo so we can get it. Um, we'll use the git uh, Ansible module that we used earlier. Uh, so we have it here. Um, you know, we, we, we clone the repo so that we can use it afterwards. Um, then we need to find the latest versions that are available. So you probably know about Ansible Galaxy. Uh, Ansible Galaxy has an API. So uh, you know, if we, if we dig a little bit into the API, uh, we can uh, search for the collection that we're interested in and find out what is the latest version. Um, and then we need to download these collections. So there's a project called uh, Ansible, and I'll get into the details a little bit later. But um, the project wraps around some bits of the Ansible Galaxy API, such that we can download the collections um, uh, as fast as possible. So we download these collections. Um, then uh, we need to aggregate change log fragments. So generally speaking, when there's a new pull request in an Ansible mm -hmm. collection, uh, we request re contributors to add a change log fragment to their, to their patch, such that you know, we have, we're able to put something in the change log. And you know, <laughs> handling that manually would be, um, would be a lot of burden for the maintainers. So you know, we ask like, nicely, can you include a change log fragment? So there's a couple here. Um, but generally speaking, it, 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 it um, it's a way to uh, describe, is this a minor change, is this a breaking change, um, and are there impacts about this change? So we have a lot of fragments here. We need to aggregate them somehow um, into something that would look like this, uh, the, the change log file. So for every release, we have a full change log that aggregates um, all of the change log fragments from every collection into this single change log. So Despite the fact that we have over 100 collections, we don't expect you to go to every single individual collection and reading all of the changes. You can just go here. Um, I, that might be a bit of a way I do control F, you know, search for the thing that I'm interested in, and there you have it. Uh, there's some headers there, so you can use that too. Um, and then we have something called the porting guide. So the porting guide is mostly about the breaking changes, the major changes, the deprecations, the removals, things that you might want to know if you're upgrading from an Ansible major version to the other. So if you're upgrading from Ansible 6 to Ansible 7, you might want to look at this file. Um, it's also up on the docs.ansible.com website, if not mistaken. Um, so this is what you want to look when you're interested in updating your Ansible installation. We need to do this file too. Um, so we have uh, Ansible that takes care of that. Uh, Ansible has um, a, a sub-library, I guess, uh, a sub-project called Ansible Changelog, which helps, um, which helps the, the collection maintainers uh, meld the, those uh, changelog fragments into a, a single release file when they build the collection. Um, and so uh, this, is, this is how 
uh, you know, we end up with these uh, change log and um, porting guide files. Then uh, we need some Python packaging files too, uh, you know, including that setup.py. Um, these are also provided by Ansible. Uh, they are Jinja templates, so you know, maybe we could use them from within Ansible too, uh, but you know, right now that's where they are. Mm -hmm. um, and so this allows us to do some templating uh, regarding um, you know, uh, some version requirements. So for example, um, in uh, Ansible 7, we will pin Ansible core to uh, 2.14 and above. Uh, Ansible 6, it would be 2.13, and then uh, it, would go <laughs> it would go higher than 2.13, but lower than 2.14, such that we don't upgrade Ansible core uh, to, uh, throughout the cycle. So some of those Python packaging files. Um, and then we need to actually build the package. So I showed you earlier the, the Python setup.py uh, as this command. So here it's run in Python. It could run as an Ansible command task. It, it's, not very, uh, it's not very important, but we need to do it. So <laughs> this is how it's done right now. Um, and then we also build uh, since Ansible 5 or 6, uh, we provide uh, wheels for the package. So this has greatly improved the performance of the installation of the package because basically there's, there's a lot of files um, and installing the wheel is just much, much faster um, amongst other things. So we build the wheel. It's kind of the same command, um, but it's vdist underscore wheel. Um, and yeah, that's it. So then we can pull all of these bits together with Ansible. Um, there are different tools, different places. Um, we can take that and pull it all together uh, with Ansible. So a command task that runs uh, Ansible. So Ansible provides a CLI. Uh, you can build, um, uh, this is the task that updates uh, the version ranges for alpha and beta releases. Um, we, we set up feature freeze. So uh, the, the, the role can handle you know, when we have a pre-release um, so people can test ahead of time. Uh, and then this is the part that actually builds the package. Um, and then because this is Ansible, we have all the tools that Ansible provides to help us do this. Um, so Ansible Galaxy, it's better nowadays, but um, a while back it tended to have some um, instability, let's say, uh, which we felt also when we built the package. Uh, but because this is Ansible, we can tell it, you know, if it fails, just retry and, and retry three times. And, you know, at the end of the process, hopefully we've done a successful uh, build out of that. Um, and then, uh, where is that? Uh, oh, yeah. So there's two steps actually involved. So there's the prepare step uh, from Ansible. And then there's the part that actually builds the package. Um, so we, we, we tell Ansible, build the package with this version. So 7.0.0, for example. And these, is, these are all Ansible variables, so I can override them if I need to. Uh, and then the same thing here, I, I, um, we, we can retry uh, in case it fails. Uh, then <laughs> we install Ansible with Ansible. Um, so now we've built the package, we've got a tarball file, and we want to test that it actually works. It's not horribly broken. We can, we can uh, eventually ship that to PyPI. Um, how can we do that? Well, we can install it and run some integration testing around of it. Um, so here I installed um, uh, using the pip package, uh, the pip module, sorry. I installed the built package into a virtual environment such that it's not, you know, polluting the system libraries and such. Um, and then I load the dependencies file um, that are provided by Ansible build data. Um, and then I check that the version of Ansible core is the one that we expect, right? So we never know, it could happen. Uh, the wrong, we, we've forgotten a variable somewhere. There's a bug, there's a regression, something. And then we get, we get a version of Ansible core that we do not expect. Um, so it's inexpensive to test it, so we do, and then, you know, it, it may avoid uh, some problems in the future. 
Um, then we want to test what got installed as part of the package. So I told you that Ansible includes a bunch of collections, and we want to double check that the package actually contains the collections that we expected to. Because again, we never know, there could be a bug somewhere, um, there's uh, an expected collection that comes in, um, there's you know, uh, one that is missing, so we want to make sure that you know, we're not forgetting anything. So we run uh, an Ansible command, we, we check the, um, the, the collections that are installed, and then we validate that they are um, included. Um, and yeah, we, we, we uh, validate that they're in the package, basically. But we must go deeper. The stream is frozen? Oh, that's unfortunate. We have the expert that will look into it. Um, I will carry on while, while this go. Uh, we must go deeper. Um, so we need to test Ansible with Ansible Playbook. Um, so we have Ansible that has installed And then with this Ansible inside the virtual environment, we will run a playbook to test that the package you know, works the way it's intended to. Um, and you know, I, I think that, that's funny, but you know. <laughs> um, so there is a So we're not doing anything with this test right now. So we, we, we test the file, um, but the results we just print to screen so we can lock them or you know, review them at some point. Um, but I would, have liked, um, I would have liked to gate the, the release of the package on something like this. So pretend, um, so this, this might be clear once I explain what this file is actually about. So let me, get, let me do that. Um, so, this file, Ansible built-in runtime, I'll open it up in a new tab here. Can I do that? Yes, I can. <laughs> Maybe I can't. So, uh, <laughs> because it's, it's about like 4,000 lines long, and basically what this file does, it is what redirects. So if you don't use the fully qualified collection name for the modules, like let's say you use command instead of Ansible built-in command. So this is the file that maps command to Ansible built-in command. And so on for every module that were part of Ansible before everything split into collections in 2.10. So uh, as of 2.9, you know, the, these, these were accurate, um, but the file, uh, to my knowledge, was not kept up to date. Uh, but my intent was to eventually keep, keep it up to date so that you know, people could continue using um, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, modules names without necessarily using the FQDN, uh, the EFQCN all the time. So I didn't manage to get that, but it exists. Um, you know, so if you don't, if you didn't know that it exists, now now you do, um, and so that's how it works. Um, so then, we need to tell, uh, we're going to be testing Ansible with Ansible Playbook, running Ansible, with the Ansible repo. So we clone the Ansible repo, and inside this repo, there are integration tests. So um, uh, in, uh, here, so if you go to github.com slash ansible slash ansible, you will find the test directory integration targets. And this is where all the integration tests, or at least most of them, uh, are located. And these are used to uh, integration test uh, Ansible core itself. So you'll find um, integration tests for every module. Command, uh, include vars, uh, which is mentioned here. So this is just a sanity check, really. Um, I would have liked to include more roles in there. So maybe we can do that one day. Um, but these, these, um, a lot of these tests are intended to run from Ansible test, which is um, the test framework for Ansible. Um, so include virus is very um, self-contained, let's say. So you can actually include it as a, any regular role. It will run and it will test it. You know, include virus actually works. Um, so yeah, I, I think that that's pretty funny. <laughs> and then we need to record all that with a parrot. Uh, named Ara. So I will tell you about Ara. Um, but before, I want, to tell, I want to ask you, is this cheating? Because I said uh, we would build Ansible with Ansible, uh, but then you know we have Ansible and we have a Git repo, and, but then we still did it with Ansible, right? So is this cheating? No, no hands in the room. So it's not cheating, right? So <laughs> I'm happy with this outcome. Um, I, I think it's not. Because um, Ansible is a great abstraction layer um, for automating workflows and integrating tools together. So you have different tools. You might have, you know, Terraform and you know whatever other tool, um, and then you can bring them together, whether it is explicitly about configuration management or not. Um, what I've shown you so far is nothing about configuration management. It's about building a package. But I have a bunch, these bunch of tasks where I could have perhaps written a bash script instead. But a bash script doesn't provide me all of the tools that Ansible has, all these modules, all these, you know, retry, and everything, the, all that logic, is, it's available to me, uh, so I use it, right? So I think it's a great abstraction layer, and I hope you think so too. So let me tell you about ARA. So ARA is another recursive acronym. Um, and it features simplicity as a core principle. So I like to say, and the, the, the people from the community team might remember this, but I like to say that simplicity is a feature because, well, if simplicity is not a feature, um, you know, it's easy to implement new features and stuff at the expense of simplicity. So things become complex and then you add more stuff. And then, but then if simplicity is not a feature, you know, there are trade-offs that you can do. So, um, it's another um, recursive acronym. Um, so what it does, it records playbooks. Um, we will uh, go into a demo here shortly. Uh, so it records playbooks, but it also records all sorts of stuff. Uh, hosts, tasks, results, files. It allows you to attach things, um, generic um, key value data uh, and attach it to your playbooks if you want to. Um, and so I have a demo here let me open this up. I hope it works better. Oh, there's the Ansible bulletin file. Let me, so this is the dark theme, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I just wanted to show you real quick. So you, you see all the modules and how they map to the different collections, basically. So there's, there's a lot of stuff in there. I said I was 4,000 lines, I was close. No, it's almost 10,000 lines. So, you know, maybe one day this file will be updated. Um, it hasn't been touched since 2021, um, but there you go. That's the built-in file. So I have 
I have Ara here. I, I prefer the dark theme, but you know, there's a light theme also available. Probably better if... Is it better in bright? Yes? All right, cool. Um, so this is what a playbook report looks like. Um, I won't go through um, all of the, the things in depth. Um, I have a talk tomorrow where I, I go into more details, uh, but I want to do this demo here. So I told you we would build Ansible with Ansible, and this is the last time I built the Ansible package um, with, uh, and recorded it with Ara, it was back in May. Um, so, you know, it's been a while, but it, you know, it's there. Um, I built it with Ansible Core 212 to, to, to back then, um, with RI 159. Um, you know, there's a couple of tasks, a couple of results. The files are here. So, um, this is great because your playbook and mole files, they change over time, right? So, you will improve them, you will change them, you will have features and so on. Um, but these are the playbooks and role files recorded as they ran. So if you ran it say six months ago, these are the files as of six months ago. So if you go, if you can open up the file um, and you know, the playbook is here. Yeah, it's pretty, you know, it just includes the role, but you know, um, it's available. Uh, you have um, each host that were um, involved in the playbook. I only have local host here, but I could have, you know, a dozen, hundred servers. Um, we would see the results here. Um, records, there's no records here. Um, Ara has um, a, a module called Ara Record. So um, the, com the most common use case for it is probably to uh, record the git commit hash from which you run the playbooks. So you can uh, record a, a key called git, git version perhaps, and then put the, the version of your commit in there. And so it will be attached to your playbook. Um, so if I, if I go in the host, uh, host page here, um, I will have, um, if I gathered facts, they would all be here, but the playbook just needed the Ansible Python fact, so that's all there is. But if there would be all um, uh, gather facts true, you would have the OS version, the OS distribution, the IP addresses, you know, uh, all of the facts, they would be here. Um, then I have the, the tasks that ran for this particular host, but it's kind of redundant because, well, there's only a single host here. Uh, then I have the tasks that ran as part of the playbook. So, um, for example here, um, if I go, uh, I see the status, of course, and the module that it ran for. Uh, if, I, if I dig into the details, uh, Please, Wi-Fi. <laughs> Live demo gods, be with me. All right, here we go. So we have, we have this task, we have display, we have this action, we have the file that the task ran from, and the line also. So if I open this up, it will open the file and get me directly to the line where the task was run. So it's highlighted, I see here, it's this task. Um, so it gives a great context when you're you know, troubleshooting an actual problem. Um, and then this is basically everything that Ansible sends through the callback interface. Um, so I have the command that I ran as part of the task, and then you know all the the STD out for the task and so on. So this is basically um, whatever Ansible sends back, our records because well it's a parrot. Uh, going back here. Um, uh, I can I can search with within the tasks of the playbook, so you know you might have playbooks that run for hours with a lot of tasks across a lot of hosts. So you can search for results for a particular host, a particular task name. Um, if you want to, I don't know, only show the changed uh, tasks. Um, so this is basically a playbook report. Going back, um, I have a list of playbooks here. Um, this is the live demo, by the way. You can, you can go uh, demo.recordsensible.org. Um, it's public, so you can use it if you want to. Or, uh, it's read-only, uh, uh, so, but you can still use it uh, to check it out. So if I go back here, um, something I didn't mention, um, there's CLI arguments. So uh, there's not really uh, a good example here, but 
if you specify any CLI arguments as part of your Ansible or Ansible playbook command, they would show up here. Um, then what else? There are labels. So you can give names, like this one, are labels. Um, so you can, you know, uh, labels allow you to group playbooks together if you want to, if that makes sense for your use case. Uh, names, pretty much the same thing. Um, you have the version of Ansible, I told you about that. Uh, you have the controller that ran the playbook. So if you're running playbooks from, from multiple places, you know, it can help, you know, drill down. You have the user that ran the playbook as well. Um, and then you can search through all of these fields. So if I'm searching for a particular playbook that ran from a particular controller, particular status, I can search through all that. So we built Ansible, we recorded it with Ara, uh, and there's, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I could go through these other tabs here. Uh, we're actually good on time. Um, so I have a whole, so this was the playbook view. So you have playbooks, you run them, and then everything is inside a single playbook. But this is the host view. So um, uh, by default, it only shows the latest playbook that ran for each host. So if I, if I filter for local host, for example, um, uh, I ha it will toggle this, this option to include every playbook report for local host. Uh, so if you're looking, uh, if, you're, if you're troubleshooting something, you want to find out what playbooks ran you know, during last week for this machine, you can, you can find it this way. Um, so that's the, the, the host view. Uh, there is also a task view, so it's basically the same thing, but per task. So you can search for particular tasks, and what makes this page particularly interesting, at least in my use case, um, so um, you will run your playbooks multiple times a day, multiple times a week, multiple times a month, um, and pretend that you know uh, all of a sudden your your this one particular task starts failing. So you could search for this task name and then see the results across every playbook that you've ran. So maybe it started being slower, uh, you can see the duration going up, uh, maybe you can pinpoint, you know, um, bisect at which date it started failing. Um, it gives you tools to, you know, uh, make your playbooks easier to understand and troubleshoot. Um, and then, um, this is, this, there is an API, which I go into more details um, tomorrow. Um, so everything, uh, th there's a, a REST API, so um, that's what the callback uses, in fact. So the callback uses the API to record databases, uh, to record playbooks inside the database. Um, and then there's a CLI, the CLI also uses the API. Um, it wasn't always this way, but now there's an API, so it's great. Um, this is uh, available, um, and then what else? Um, I think that's it. So let me go back to my slides here. We are still good on time. Um, so if you want to get started with Ara, this is what it looks like. Um, you, it, Ara will run wherever Ansible runs. So whether that's with um, AWX or our automation controller, whether that's with Jenkins, GitLab CI, GitLab CI, wherever you run Ansible, you just install uh, Ara right next to it. Um, when you include the server dependencies, it allows you to run the server. Um, uh, it's not required by default, so there uh, it, it will. Um, there, the, the default API client is called offline. So what it does is it doesn't require you to run a server or service. Uh, you can just you know uh, uh, tell Ansible to use the R callback plugin. You run your playbook, and then that's it. You know you don't need to change your work, your existing workflows. You had Ara on, uh, next to it, it will record your playbooks. So by default, this is an SQLite database, local. So you can you know, run this off of your laptop, your Bastion host, or you know, whatever. Um, you can use the CNI. Um, and then if you want to run uh, the built-in web server, you can do that too uh, with Ara Manage web ser uh, run server. Um, if you want to run a server, you can. Um, so why you might want to do that? Uh, perhaps you want to aggregate results from multiple locations. So pretend you're running playbooks from different places. 
Uh, you can configure ARA, the ARA callback to send the results back to a single server. So you have like a single pane of glass to see all your payload results. So here um, I create a directory where uh, the database and the settings file will, be, will live. Uh, and then you can, you, there's, um, there's a Docker image uh, that is uh, published by the project. You can use Docker or Podman. I don't judge. <laughs> Either works. I prefer Podman, but you know, it's okay. Uh, the the, um, the um, uh, container images are available on both docker.io uh, and create.io. Um, and then once the server is running, um, it's basically the same thing. I install Ansible and Ara. This time I don't need the server dependencies because, well, the server is running somewhere. I tell Ansible to use the callback plugin from Ara. I tell Ara to use the HTTP API client. And then I tell it to use uh, the, the server that I just spun up inside a container. This could be anywhere, but you know, I just spun up a container on my machine, so this is where it lives. Then, you know, it's the same thing. Uh, you run a playbook, it'll be recorded. It, that's it, there, there's, no, there's nothing else. Um, and then, you know, I don't need to type in ARA manage run server because, well, there's already a server running, so I can, I can go and check it out. Um, uh, I'm, I'm about on time. Uh, if you want to know more, um, I'm here, so you know you can come up and, and chat and ask questions. Uh, but I will have a, a talk that goes into uh, more details about how Ara actually works. Uh, Ara was not actually the point of the talk, but uh, you know it, it, it's what recorded Ansible building Ansible. Um, uh, there will also be uh, the Ansible Contributor Summit on the French, I think it's French call day uh, on Wednesday. Um, I will be here as well. It's the same room actually, so uh, yeah, we can we can see each other. And then last year at FASM 2022, it was virtual, unfortunately, uh, but I did a talk, it was recorded, so if you want to check that out. Um, there is also a live demo where um, uh, I spin up an AWX instance and then hook up Para to it. So if, you, if you're interested in that, it's recorded and available there. Um, and with that, uh, I will take questions, but before opening for questions, um, uh, what, what I've told you about uh, is really community driven. So we have an Ansible community channel um, that you can chat, uh, come and chat with us on the Rada chat, um, but it's also available in Matrix. We, all, we have a, an informal uh, packaging uh, interest group uh, where the people that are interested in the packaging of Ansible itself hang out. Um, so it's not limited to PyPI. We have people from Fedora, from CentOS, from you know, various distributions. So it's very low signal to noise ratio. Um, if you want to come help, chat, contribute, this is where you want to go. Um, if you want to, if you want to chat about Ara, there's channels for that as well. Uh, as well. Um, and I guess that's it. So I will open up for questions. Yeah, you can talk. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? Don't be shy. Yes, I have a question here. Can you reintegrate um, the recordings? If you, on multiple developer stations, record a session, can you reintegrate that into one representation? So the question is, can you integrate? Can you record playbooks from different locations to a single one? Afterwards. So record After them individually the fact. and then merge them. Um, Every session gets a different file, right? So, so it's a good question. So the, the, the question, as I understand it, is you have three different ARAs recording playbooks, and then you want to reconcile them into a single instance. Do I have this right? Yes. Yes. So the answer is kind of. So <laughs> it depends. No, uh, no, seriously. Um, so there is no feature in ARA today that allows you to merge databases. There's, there'd be dragons because, you know, foreign keys, references, dependencies, everything. So if someone wants to contribute something like that to Ara, I'd be happy to review the patch. But it doesn't exist today. I don't have the use case for it. Um, so what you can do, though, is there is a special database backend called distributed SQLite. So what this backend does is um, it was initially developed um, for the use case in the OpenStack community. 
that ran you know millions of Ansible playbooks every month. Um, so how it works is you have ARA that records locally to an SQLite database. Then you take this SQLite database, you send it to an ARA server somehow. Um, that's on you. You know, SCP, RSync, FTP, you know, whatever floats your boat. Once the database is on the ARA server at a specified location, say var www reporting something something, the, the distributed Distributed SQLite middleware will map a new URL to a location on the file system. So basically what this allows you to do is not see all of the databases in a single instance, but it will provide um, the ability to see each individual database from a single location. So there is a, a very simple index page. So when you, when you go there, when the backend is enabled, it will show you a list of viable databases. So you can click on that and lead you to, you know, the the ARA instance for that particular database. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Yes, I have a question from Carol in the back. Well, who sent you an online question? Oh, an online question. Sure. Hello. Does ARA require getting the callback plugins disabled via Python scripts, or can it be configured via Ansible.cfd? Um, that's an excellent question. So let me go. Let me go inside a shell. David, to, oh yes, sure. So, so the question was: uh, Is it necessary to use? Um, let me go back here. So the question is: Is it necessary to do this, or can I put that into an Ansible.cfg file? That is the question, uh, which is an excellent question. And so let me show you what this command actually does. Um, thankfully, I have a shell here. It is, it is dark, I'm sorry, uh, I hope that's fine. Um, let me go to the git repo and do this. So then I got the command here. So really what this command does is it prints the location of the callback plugin. Um, that might seem trivial, but in fact it's pretty complicated. In, because depending on how you install Ara, on which the Linux distro, whether it's in a virtual environment inside a container image or whatever, it will be in different locations. Maybe it will be in USR local, maybe it will be in USR lib, maybe it will be in the user home directory. You can't, you can't really tell. Ara knows where it's located, so there's a command here that prints the location of the callback. So this is the easiest way to do it. Uh, this is what I do. I, I put this in my bash RC and you know I call it a day. Um, you can put this path in an Ansible CFG file and it will work until the location changes for some reason, right? So if, you're, if you have multiple users, you know, using a wide range of distros and configurations, um, it will, uh, you know, that, that's why the, the helper exists, right? So um, I hope that answers the question. Um, are we, do we have time for one more? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, we have time for one more question? No more questions. All right, so I have some very rare and limited quantity R stickers. I will leave these in front. Uh, if you have one of those stickers, it's because you've met me uh, in some shape or form. Um, it's a limited quantity. I will have some more tomorrow if you don't get one. So do pick up one. It was nice. Thank you.